My name is Chansa, Chansa from Jamsrungjo, and I'm a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department. I came from Mongolia, and Mongolia is one of the few countries in the world with vast and open rangelands. But also at the same time, uh, facing with the challenges like other countries are facing with is rangeland degradation. I started this PhD program at Colorado State University because I have uh, some years of experience working with the local herders, but they used to ask me a lot of questions about the ecology, plants, and particular plants. And then sometimes I feel like, gosh, I want to know more about that so that I can have a really good discussion with the local people. Through my research, I really want to bring the truth or the real information that can be really useful for the, for the policy development and for the local users. Especially, I really want to integrate the knowledge from the local people, those who are using the rangeland, and then also scientific knowledge to be used for the management and application in the future. It was really uh, rewarding for me to understand how these two different in the world is, can be joined together because I can give back to the people results of my studies so that people can use that. So Mongolia has nomadic pastoral system for at least 1,000 years. And then <clears throat> this mobile flexible movement is very essential strategy to use these arid patchy resources. And um, seasonal pastures especially is very important. And then it's still this practice is still in there. And then usually there are four big movements from winter pasture to spring pasture, spring to summer, summer to, it's not working. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. And then summer to fall pasture. And uh, <clears throat> in the winter, usually herders stay up in the mountain, close into big mountains, in front of the big leeward side of the big mountains as a protector from the wind and cold uh, winds. And in summer, in usually moves down along the open water sources. And uh, so I think in the trivia, we have this kind of question. So <laughs> there is the answer. <laughs> Simple answer, <laughs> Simpli simplified answer. Mm. So in Mongolia, <clears throat> there is a growing concern about the rangeland uh, degradation in Mongolia uh, due to the uh, overstocking and then also climate change. Uh, much of Mongolian rangeland uh, production has removed by livestock each year. And the, in the first map, you can see this. Uh, dark red color indicates the areas that have uh, overgrazing is really uh, creating issues. And then the below map, um, this map shows this uh, nationwide rangeland health monitoring results showed that about 65% of these stat sites uh, altered from its reference condition. And then the good news is maybe 77% of these sites can be recovered within one to five growing seasons with the careful management implications. And the bad news is these red, red sites indicate that these sites already crossed the ecological threshold and it, it really needs uh, require strong management implication to recover back. It's, and maybe it's re re reversible. And the climate is changing at the same time in Mongolia. Uh, Mean surface temperature has increased 2.1 Celsius in the last 60 years, which is greater than the global average. In this map, you can see that areas that have a high uh, temperature increase in the last 60 years. And uh, there is a, some uh, precipitation decrease also happening in some parts of Mongolia. So this combined effect of increasing temperature, decreasing precipitation could contribute this uh, soil uh, evaporation and then eventually leads to the plant uh, moisture, decreasing the plant moisture and then drought situations. Okay, so <clears throat> government of Mongolia has been uh, attempting to uh, include this local level management planning into the formal monitoring, but they always lacks the capacity to involve the herders in more widely in this monitoring. And then there is a risk if herders don't participate or don't understand this formal monitoring, then they will not trust and then they will not use the monitoring results. And <coughs> under also, okay, sorry. 
Community-based management groups has been established since late 90s after these consecutive drought and zots. And then the good news is this com some studies show that these groups are more proactive in addressing management-related issues and then also uh, uh, adapting this uh, innovative and then also traditional management implications for their activities. But uh, but still there is a gap, you mean, there is a disconnect between the formal monitoring and then also these innovative uh, approaches of these community groups uh, connected with this uh, formal government monitoring. So that's why there is a greater need understanding of this herders' knowledge and how it relates to formal monitoring indicators and measures. Okay, here is the, where we did our studies. We, Sampled, we conducted our study to adjacent Sums. Sum is a district in a mountain in four step, and then two in the step, and then two in the desert step. And then we conducted our ecological studies on 26 winter pastures, and then also we interviewed 26 herders, those who uh, traditionally uh, graze the livestock in, this, in these plots, in these sites. Um, after we selected winter camp, we collected ecological data and uh, we selected the winter camp and then set our three plots, 50 by 50 meter size, and along these grazing gradients and we assume that the highest grazing or livestock use effect will be close to the winter shelter and the medium and the lightest. And then on each plot we collected all these vegetation variables <coughs> and then also plus soil uh, data. And then next year we went to this uh, pasture, winter shelters, and then uh, interviewed the traditional owner of these uh, winter uh, camps. Because these herders uh, have traditional owner, they have inherently familiar about the ecology, weather, and also management histories of these plots. And we had the, our interview consisted of the two parts. One was the more quantitative, and then we asked them, brought these parts, uh, plots and then ask them to give a rate about the condition. And we use the ruler and then ruler was uh, 0 to 40 and then if condition is not good they give lower score. If condition is good then they can give the better score, uh, a higher score. Um, and also we ask them what attributes or what the indicators they use to give that score. You know, what is the rangeland degradation? What indicators they use? What are the causal factors to give these uh, indicators and to give this uh, assessment? And uh, plus we have also some climate and also uh, herder family related information. There are four sections all together in this interview. Yeah, the data analysis, of course, we use this coding and then some quantitative approach. For quantitative approach, we use the size analysis. And plus, we also use the clustering analysis and ordination to understand this distinct plant community composition and then relate this to measure our drivers of change and also plus herders' rating. Okay. Okay, here's the results from our interview. This is the qualitative part. And <clears throat> overall herders in these three ecological zones used or named the same indicators. Um, like, oh, we look at the vegetation composition, we look at the urvats, so urvats means the production. And then this is the local name. And then we look at this uh, number of plants emerge or sprout during the growing season, herders call it gart, and then also they look at the, if there is a good forage plants present in the pasture, that's the main indicator. But the ranking order were different among herders in different ecological zones. And then more music, more productive zones, herders, oops, sorry, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Look at more vegetation composition, but in the dry desert step, herders first top rank. This is the ranked order. First ranked indicator for dry uh, area was more looking at the forage palatability, individual plants, and <clears throat> then we asked about the causal attributes. What is the, you know, what is the main causal factor if you want to have if you have a healthy rangeland? And the music northern part herders said. Livestock number. If we keep the livestock carrying capacity, then rangeland will be healthy. But in dry desert step, they said, and also music in medium, 
uh, step region, they all uh, attribute rangeland health to the rainfall uh, and precipitation. And then we asked, okay, what is the degraded rangeland? In, uh, is that? Oh, yeah. And Herder said, it was very interesting also. Herder's in Mesic for, for, uh, sorry, for degraded rangelands, Herder's in all zones also used the multiple indicators, but again, the ranking order were different in different ecological zones. Like in Mesic mountain forest step, Herder's look at the more vegetation structure and above ground structure, but in desert step, Herders were talking about the below ground or roots damaged or roots died, then this is the real degradation issues for us. But in step herders, which is located in between these two uh, ecological zones, they talk about more soil surface related indicators. They brought very first, okay, we look at this. If there is more bare ground, exposed bare ground, this indicates rangeland is degrading. And then some herders also mentioned about if the topsoil is becoming harder and open, then this is the issue of the rangeland. And <coughs> then we asked about the causes of rangeland degradation. Again, it was consistent. Herders in mountain forest step said, livestock number is the very first issue of the degradation. But in desert step also it was consistent. They talk about the temporal and spatial precipitation has been really changing. We usually have a late spring uh, precipitation. And also fall precipitation is very important because in spring we can first plants emerge by having enough uh, fall precipitation. And then if you have also only spring precipitation, then also plants will be less damaged by the spring uh, dust storm. So the main reason of the precipitation pattern changes also causes this root damage, root uh, death in this zone. That was the herder's explanation. But in the steppe region, um, it was a similar like uh, attributed, rangeland degradation attributed to more grazing or management related issues in this zone. Okay, so many TEQ study approaches are trying to uh, identify these uh, quantitative indicators and then so that it will be easy to integrate with the ecological studies. So we were thinking, okay, this assessment score can be the one of our quantitative indicators and how it differ among herders on these ecological zones. So we, overall herders give lower score those in the uh, disturbed sites or disturbed uh, plots close to the winter shelter, but there was not much differences in giving the score between these 500 and 1,000 meter plots. And the, another thing was herders in all three different ecological zones give similar there was not much uh, variation or differences between giving the score to the plots. Um, yeah. And, and then after that, we used the linear regression to understand, okay, what is the relationship between our vegetation data with this quantitative uh, score uh, given by herders? And <coughs> interestingly, uh, we didn't find there was no, interestingly, there was no significant differences, uh, significant relationship between herder score with these vegetation variables in the mountain first step. But we, herders score and total foliar cover, cover of palatable plants and total green biomass was uh, positive and significant relationship with the herders assessment. But interestingly also in desert step, we saw more several more uh, significant relationship between the herders evaluation with our fall vegetation, uh, field vegetation data. And then we thought, okay, so what was the herders indicator they were telling us? And then I just brought this uh, mm, table here again. So if you can see that, urgats of plant growth and the uh, on number of plants emerge or sprout during growing season in good forage plants present in the pasture, which is actually similar what, uh, what this uh, vegetation variable. So what we thought, okay, so maybe total green biomass can be 
as comparable with herders identified indicator ERGATS. Because also we see this some significant and positive relationship. And then maybe cover of palatable plants, which is also both desert step and step herders uh, use these indicators also had a positive and significant relationship. So we thought cover of palatable plants can be used as a comparable as used can be used as indicator as comparable with good forage plants present. And then total foliar cover can be the cart and then species regions, of course, vegetation composition, and then we see this significant relationship. So there is a, some, what we saw, like different language, different way of seeing, but they are uh, actually, we are talking the same thing. Another thing was, uh, because when herders give this score, they, I think they think in the mind all, all these indicators. So that's why maybe also we found this significant relationship, one score with the different vegetation variables. But the question is, what's happening in here? So this is the, maybe the next question for us to, to dig in. Uh, but I'm not presenting in this uh, talk today. OK, so then we, um, <coughs> we then, OK, we wanted to dig in our understanding, OK, what about the factors? You know, what heard this discussed during our interviews were, um, what factors do you attribute? So we uh, have this, our uh, vegetation data. Mm -hmm. So we use the classification and ordination uh, on our vegetation data. So 72 species included the class cl classification in the mountain forest step. And then we, there were three community groups identified. And community, Groups uh, actually the um, in the ordination space showed that the classical typical pattern of the vegetation change in response to the grazing. So in community group one, we can see more disturbance indicator species increases with the grazing, increased grazing, and community group dominant species in community group was like. A, um, also increase their species and community group two, dominant species of community two were more palatable, more ma characteristic species of the mountain forest step. So in other words, it's like a intermediate disturbance hypothesis or hump shaped like uh, structure from our studies. And <coughs> um, oh yeah, it should be here. And then next we looked at, and then, um, what is the causal factor, you know? What is the main driving factor of this vegetation change in this ordination space? And the main uh, livestock number, here is a, sorry, oh, sorry. There's a mountain, sorry. <coughs> yeah, here, yeah. okay, sorry. Total SFE is a livestock number. In Mongolia, we use the sheep forage unit. So main axis is correlated with the livestock number. And <coughs> also, <coughs> herders, we included in our analysis also herders rating score. And the herders rating score is also correlated with the same axis, but the direction is opposite of the livestock number. And um, okay, maybe I should see here. And the precipitation, growing season main precipitation was uh, correlated with the axis too. And <coughs> So what we concluded is main driving factor of plant community composition in this zone is uh, livestock use, grazing, and also precipitation. And uh, which is also um, supported by our interview where we asked from herders what is the main indicator, they said vegetation composition, and then what is the causal factor, they said the livestock is the main factor which is supported, uh, which is supports our ordination studies. Okay. Here's the steps on. 52 species included in the classification and uh, five community groups were identified. And then interesting thing was um, community groups one, three, and five are more grazing induced uh, more grazing associated species. But they, in ordination space, they are in uh, two different uh, places. And then the reason is maybe the main 
growing season precipitation is correlated with the axis too, and then these sites may be very dry, so that's why they are very sensitive or more vulnerable for the grazing. And then main, um, Aspect and the livestock number was also correlated with the main axis in this zone. I should use this, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also, interesting thing in this zone is herder score was in the same direction with the total livestock use. And then herders seemed like giving higher score, those plots with the more good grass, a palatable grass species, because community group two and community group four are more uh, sites with very good palatable grass species, in this, uh, which is very common, typical in this zone. So that's why they're giving maybe giving higher score here, but still we don't understand is giving the livestock number is correlated with the main axis, and then also the, with her, have a same direction with the herder score. So there is a something going on. And the community groups are also, in our nation species, a little bit spattered, scattered. But the main, our conclusion is, okay, precipitation is the main driving factor, which is also supported by our herders interview. Herders said, for the healthy rangeland, precipitation is the main driving factor. But also, at some time, when we asked the degraded rangeland, herders in this zone said, livestock number and then out of season grazing is the issue so which means this is kind of intertwined issues in this uh, in this zone in the desert step uh, 37 species included in the classification in the ordination and then there were four community groups identified in this zone uh, and main <coughs> factor of the Plant community classification was maybe this more grass, a more resist, uh, more grass species, more stable, um, recoverable species, and like community group three has a more stipagobica, more grass species, but in herders also tend to give higher score to this, and the main uh, driving factor in this zone was, yeah. Same as the growing season and the long-term yearly precipitation correlated with the axis one. And aspect in the slope, other environmental variables correlated with the axis two. Um, but again, this is also interesting in one desert step holder score and the livestock number were also in the same direction. But the vegetation wise, we look at dating also give more grass species, uh, which is also very useful uh, forage for herders during the winter. And we think maybe based on the community uh, composition, in the, des in the step, her in the step, uh, it's livestock is changing the composition, but here maybe the livestock is changing the forage, you know, in this, um, to the, in these uh, two different ecological zones. Okay. So, conclusion. So overall, what we found is herders observe the herders identified indicators correspond with the indicators used in our ecological study, and uh, herders use more vegetation variables when rangeland is healthy, but they used the soil, they brought the soil variables when range, rangeland is degrading, especially it was true in steppe and desert steppe ecological zones. And <coughs> herders ranking order were different when uh, we asked them to rank. So this indicates that uh, there is a differences of ecological zones and then this will be very important if uh, we have these integrated indicators and then also especially when we are interpreting this monitoring results, you know, from the herder's perspective, this is very important for us to understand and to know about that. Um, and uh, one thing I also want to add here was also this urbatskart, um, urmatlesirik, or shinging, these kind of the terms herders were using was very common, but the, interestingly, in the previous TX studies conducted in Mongolia, occasionally mentioned about these terms. And 
that was also very interesting for us. Um, <coughs> and Herder's assessment score can be used as a integrated indicators and then also it can be very fast tools you know and then increase the coverage of the rangeland monitoring if herders use these indi uh, uh, integrated indicators and uh, <coughs> yeah and then okay so drivers of change of rangeland condition was uh, our results from ordination classifications supported this herders, herders identified causal factors, which means researchers and then herders are observing same thing, similar thing. And also, this, uh, the first herders ranking order actually helped us to understand also ordination space in the main causal factors and then different accesses. And then this was also corresponds with, uh, uh, with our uh, studies. Yeah. Okay, so so what you know? What we can contribute for this uh, from our studies? Our study says we should have a common language. Otherwise, you know, if we don't have a common language, it will be uh, uh, for the formal monitoring. It is very essential. Right now, we see that herders and then researchers and the government monitoring actually use the same indicators. Only thing is, that we are not having the same common language. So. Translating these indicators into common language is very essential first step. And then second one is, if we understand this common language, then it will help us to integrate the indicators, have integrated indicators. And then if we have these integrated indicators, then it will help us to mutual understanding. As I was mentioning in my previous uh, uh, slides, like herders don't trust and use, but if we have this mutual understanding and integrated indicators, th this will increase the herders' trust and this will increase the herders use. On the other hand, we already have the existing monitoring results and then these results can be more meaningful if we have these in integrated indicators. And integrated indicators also can lead us to have more participatory monitoring approach. So a participatory monitoring approach can also help um, to strengthen our uh, community organization and then this community organization could potentially help or lead this participatory monitoring. On the other hand, formal government's monitoring can increase the spatial and temporal scope of the monitoring and then also usually there is a delay between monitoring and responding back to the local community for the management implications. So this could help to increase the speed, speeds if we have this participatory monitoring. Uh, approach and <coughs> most importantly is collected data turned into useful information and the useful information improves the management and then sustainable leadership uh, stewardship of herders and all uh, all uh, peoples so okay so this is the idea and then there is uh, some potentials we see and then the first step is a common language so then how we can operationalize and then in this in this uh, technic technology is developing uh, is uh, so one important step is maybe they have a meaningful discussion and meaningful interaction is very essential so the strength this can also strengthen the community groups uh, in more um, uh, meaningful way and then another thing is uh, uh, in Mongolia, every herders have a cell phone. And then if herders, if we ask herders to use the cell phone and then send this assessment score to, this, to the uh, server, and then we can have a quick, rapid assessment. And then also, at some time also, herders feel more involved in participating. So that's why it's kind of two-way help. And using this technology can improve the response back from response, uh, improve, increase the, reduce the timing of the monitoring response back to the local government and the local communities. So with that, thank you all. And questions? Yes? Um. It looked like you, you didn't get to interview that many 
female herders, but you had a, a few. Did you notice any interesting differences between what they were queuing in on for? Mm -hmm. for yeah, in this talk we didn't include, yeah, you're right. We drew 26 herders and 20 of them were herders, which is kind of common pattern with the previous TIK studies. And uh, <clears throat> we are working on it, but right now I cannot tell. But the, the one difference was, um, Female herders have a more kind of detailed information, kind of, um, and then also male herders was more kind of uh, talk about in a more broader scale. That's kind of a little bit differences, but uh, I need to work on that because this is the different part. I was thinking to look at the gender wise and age wise and herders characteristics how influence on that. Yeah. For this one, we are just focusing on the monitoring indicators. Yeah. Yes. Oops. Uh, I, I thought it was really interesting that in your comparison between the ecological indicators used by the herders mm -hmm. and your own assessment that there was good agreement in the steppe and desert habitats but not in the montane habitats. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is and what does that mean? Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is also still I'm kind of thinking why it's like that. But our expectation was maybe mountain herders were more kind of give us more consensus or more agreement, but it didn't. And uh, I don't know, there is, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, but it's very good. Uh, and the next step, we really need, I really want to dig down, you know, about this qualitative information. Yes? So I think one thing with the mountain before step is that they actually did agree in terms of species of composition. That's yes. What the yeah. Nations showed, um, and and that seemed to be one of the main things we were looking at. And the other indicators <coughs> we used, we had the cover of palpable plants, but it didn't look as holistically at species composition. So there was there was correspondence in the composition part, but not so much when we looked at individual indicators of production. And yes. Mm -hmm. and so forth. it's also possible that there's a relationship, but it's not a linear one. So we were looking. Yeah, there is not, I didn't mention that, but there is not a linear relationship between the herders uh, identified parts and then um, herders score and then total foliar cover. It was a kind of cubic relationship. And yeah, I didn't include it in here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sorry. Yes? Um, the palatability of grasses related to the other mission? Elevation? Yeah, or, uh, yeah, or the type of the process. That's what we call it. Okay, um, these three different ecological zones are pretty different. And then step zone is maybe uh, show that both characteristic depending on the climate. If, uh, but the palatability wise, um, uh, the, the species in different ecological zones are different. So that's why the palatable, if I understand correctly, your question is, pal yeah, there are palatable species in both zones, but the palatable species in mountain forest step, not necess uh, not the, cannot be uh, grow in the desert step, you know? And then, yeah, that's, that's how I, can I answer your question? Yeah, is there any, uh, I mean, harder choice uh, sorry, um, could you repeat? Okay. The question is that does the horror has um, certain preference mm -hmm. on the grazing for certain ecology reasons? We have three thousand reasons, right? So does the horror has certain preference on the reasons? Yeah, it's not a true nomadic, it's transhumans, because every herder moved back to the winter shelter and then uh, stay there in winter and go to the summer and then uh, fall and spring pastures. Um, but this movement pattern can be disrupted when there is a drought of zod. So the preference, of course, there, if there is no forage and if there is zod, zod is a very harsh winter, no forage for livestock, or if it's drought, then Herders' preference will move to the places where they have uh, enough forage for their livestock. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. So I, I have an 
asked questions quite like you've asked. It's different studies that I've done in East Africa, mm -hmm. but I, I get a little bit of similar information from people, just, just framed differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm picking up now is that as the population mm -hmm. is growing and livestock density is increasing, mm -hmm. that people are starting now to attribute changes to livestock density. And so I wonder if there might be some influence of how dense the populations are in the different places where you're conducting your survey on how the ratings of or the importance of livestock in degradation. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're conducting some of your work in mountain mm -hmm. areas in highly populated areas versus mm -hmm. low populated areas, if there might be a difference between those two and the same in the same in zone. The mm -hmm. desert stuff and the stuff. Yeah, that will be an interesting question. Um, can I repeat your question if I understood correctly? Yeah. So if we interview herders in semi ecological zones but the some are in more densely populated, and some are less densely. So, could the answer can be different, different between these two? The influence of livestock. livestock. I think people just mm -hmm. start picking up on it more, or associating how heavily areas were grazed with how many livestock were on a particular location, with how quickly mm -hmm. they had to move off of it. That's mm -hmm. what I was hearing okay. myself in Africa. You know, it's a different system, but. Yeah, when I was talking to herders, they said like if they if they want to keep the pasture healthy, they have to move quite often. Yeah, and then also when I was talking to other herders, said we want to move, you know, because if we don't move, the livestock won't be fat enough, and then the rangeland will be degraded. But because of the population, we cannot move, you know, then we used to move. So it's kind of shrinking the movement pattern. So these are the kind of two different uh, uh, pattern observation. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I wasn't quite clear on why they go up into the mountains during the winter. You might have gone over that. It. Ah. it seems counterintuitive to me. I would have thought they would have yeah. been in the mountains in the summer and then be in the grasslands in the winter. Mongolia, winter is very cold. And uh, if you are in front of the leeward side of the big mountain, it's more sheltered from the wind. And also, it's good to expose to the suns. But if you are in lower land, then uh, the wind will be very strong and then it will be very cold. So oh. that's the kind of differences. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, thank you for the presentation. So my question actually relates to, I think, your map on slide like two or three. You have an image of Mongolia, and the red dots indicate that mm -hmm. there's degraded rangelands, and the blue dots indicate that the lands are not degraded. Mm -hmm. How does that correlate with people's perception? So when you interviewed people, mm -hmm. did, did their perception of how degraded the lands were really correlate to that data? Or did they perceive the lands as more degraded or less degraded than um, mm -hmm. than the data that's being shown on the map? Mm -hmm. um, this data, this uh, rangeland health monitoring is done by uh, the government organizations, and then I don't have data, but we can overlay on the map, you know, our mm -hmm. sites. But I haven't done that. But uh, Based on our data, the herders' uh, observation and then our data actually speak to each other quite well, you know, corresponding. And then the methods we used for this, uh, our ecological data methods they used in this monitoring is the same. So it's. So you see a really close correlation. Close correlation. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just curious, when you ask the, um, the herders for their impressions of the degradation, the observations that they were making, was it completely open-ended kinds of questions, or were you giving them sort of any kinds of choices? I'm just wondering like how you grouped together then their, their mm -hmm. statements about 
you know, they may have said something different. Were you, were you then, you know? Uh, it, it was open, open ended. And then I asked first them the list the indicators, tell me the indicators and then they tell, told me. And then I asked them, could you please rank them? Which one is really, you know, explain or just really uh, showing you know, which one is the most important or least important, you know? Can you tell me the rank this for me and then they ranked it and then for the qualitative analysis I just uh, uh, put them together and grouped like them together. Like comments. So, so yeah. it seemed like there was a fairly consistent response then that, that you were able to group things together. Yeah. And then based on the frequency of the answers mm -hmm. and then based on the frequency of the, um, the rank. rank. Yeah. Yep. Question. Great. So I think that's, unless there's any other questions, thank you for coming to our seminar. And thank you for Dr. Chancelcom for her great presentation. Um, also, I think, are we going to do, who wants to do um, <laughs> a little bit of an exercise? I think that the answers were given in the presentation. Um, do you want to present the exercise? or? Um, sure. But my only... Mm -hmm. But the last thing I'll say is that um, the prize will be given next week. So on the way out the door, I guess you leave the, leave the, okay, yeah, put your name on it and put them right here on the side of the table. Yeah. All right. Thank you.